You're watching On Demand. Please check the closing time before trying to vote or enter any competition or other interactivity in this programme, as it may not count and you may still be charged. And welcome to another 60 Minutes of Cracking Conversation, courtesy of the Loose Women. With me, Christine Lampard, it's Colleen Nolan, Janice Reporter and Katie Piper. Coming up, the video that has divided holidaymakers at a Tenerife hotel, but is there really anything wrong with reserving a sunbed? And wedding woes, would you ban your own children from your wedding? Then at one o'clock... And when I got pregnant, I was in the middle of my college course, so I definitely thought, well, I'll never be able to get my national diploma. It's, it's the smash hit series where we grill a panellist about their lives before they joined Loose Women. And today, it's the turn of Katie. <laughs> From being a rebellious child to a city party girl and the events in Katie's life which changed everything. Are you kind of looking forward to it, Katie? Uh, is it bad to say I'm absolutely dreading it? No, <laughs> it's not. I think you're allowed we'll a little quiet. bit of that. <laughs> um, that's all to come a little bit later on. First, though, um, a plus-size travel content creator. That is a real job, but really? it sounds terribly, yes. Uh -huh. Very important. It, um, she has spoken out about her experiences flying as a larger traveller and has been blasted by some for her comments. The blogger complained about having to be squashed up next to another passenger, the lack of legroom, having to ask for a seatbelt extender, not being able to use her tray table and even not being able to fit into the bathroom. She's urging airlines to make flights more accessible to plus-size passengers. So is she right Janet and just to set this slightly in context she's she's not completely moaning at the airline she's almost written this blog as if to warn other passengers of the pitfalls if you are a plus size person and what airlines are maybe slightly better than others that's kind of her angle but what do you feel about where we stand with this well I'd like airlines to prioritize helping people with any kind of disability because as we know only too well if anyone uses a wheelchair for example at the moment Moment, quite often they get left on the plane till the very end they might be waiting on the plane for a very long time because airlines are so short-staffed at the moment and I mean it's not as if traveling in a wheelchair is an entirely new thing having said all that I think there are various reasons why people are overweight but the fact of the matter is that this country has an eating problem and I accept that for some people, eating is an addiction. It's a mental health crisis. Um, and there can be medical reasons why people are overweight. But I really think if you expect airlines to make special provision for overweight people or obese people, you're, I don't have an awful lot of sympathy for you because Look at it from the point of view of the normal size passengers. I mean, you know, they're not getting special treatment for only occupying one seat. And as a 15 year old, I was six foot tall uh, when I went on my first package deal holiday to the Costa Brava. And I didn't uh, expect special treatment because I was crammed up like a, a, a stick insect in a, in, a, in a tiny seat. I mean, sure, being overweight brings lots of challenges uh, into your life, but expecting airlines to go out of their way to help you for the same price ticket as people who are, you know, not overweight is a big ask. Yeah. Does that sound cruel, Kate? <laughs> I'm going to go head to head with you on this. <laughs> I, I think what this girl's doing is brilliant because she's doing a recce for other people so they can avoid humiliation or, you know, anybody that has found something not accessible for a reason to do with their, uh, whether they're able bodied, whether it's their appearance, their body, it's completely humiliating and could ruin your, your whole trip. So she's going out there and doing that research for them so that they don't have to book two seats on the airline so they know what airlines can or cannot accommodate them. And, you know, you, you touched on it there. People are overweight for lots of different reasons. Some aren't visible. We don't know why. Some might be medical, mental health. You know, and I, I personally believe 
anyone that's overweight for whatever reason, there's a lot of pain behind that story and why they got to that point. Nobody actively chooses to get to that point. So I, I think kind of shaming them and making them feel worse might send some people further down in, into a, a further spiral. But so, let me yeah, ask you an but... economic question. If they occupy more than one seat on the plane, in other words, if special larger seats were mm. made available for them, shouldn't they pay more? Well, I don't know about them paying more, but I think larger seats should be made available, yes. Not necessarily on every airline, but I think we're seeing uh, people being accommodated in larger size ambulances, bigger beds on uh, gastric uh, gastro wards in hospital. So it is happening in other sections of society. Yeah, but the problem the airlines have got is at the moment they're trying to cram more seats in to make yeah, more money. So the seats are getting money. even smaller. Mm. It's about money. Yeah. So they're not going to take seats out. And also... I totally agree with you on the on the mental health issue of why mm. people eat. But equally, you know, I have um, a friend of mine who went to a water park recently and climbed all the way up the stairs to go down the slide, you know, the tube, water tube thing. And they said, I'm sorry, you can't because you're too overweight. Now, yes, they were mortified. Yeah. But equally, it instantly made them go, oh, my God, I need to do something about that. Mm. You know, and whether that is going to see a counsellor because of why the reasons they're overeating or I just need to stop eating as much as I am. Because sometimes I'm not saying embarrassing someone into doing something, but I don't think it's necessarily always a bad thing to make someone stop and think and go, I need help. I think it's different for everyone because I think you're right. It worked for your friend. Mm. For some people, it could cause them to self-harm. It could cause them to go back to that crux even more. Whatever your crux of it's food, alcohol or drugs. But then if you're it's... enabling it, is that not just as bad? If you're not making and face the, the yeah. problem. Do you know what I mean? If you're, if you're making it really easy to just be that yeah. person, is that not also enabling them? Well, we've normalised being overweight because as a country, we've got one of the biggest weight problems in Europe. Mm. And we've somehow normalised it. So we don't, we don't, we ban the word fat. Now we talk about large. I don't know. Larger so, so, sizes, plus sizes. It's almost like we're skirting around the issue. A lot of people have reclaimed the word fat. You see a lot of content creators online who, who are plus size models say, this is who I am. I'm fat. I identify with that word. And it's, you know, lots of people, like in the LGBTQ plus yeah. community, some people identify with the word queer, some people don't. People decide what language they're comfortable yeah. with. And I think going back to the economic, you know, it's like we have a lot of plus size fashion now, high end or fast fashion. Should plus size people pay more for their clothes because it's more fabric? Yes. But they don't. In, in, in fast mm. fashion, they don't, mm. you know. So, and, and it's the same with airline seats. I think we need to accommodate who's in society and, and provide for them like we would anybody. I yeah. Think. And yeah. there's nothing worse for someone who who's just mortified for all of those very different reasons. They want to go to the bathroom and they feel like they can't. They can't. Like that is That's just, horrendous. Yeah. It's just awful. If I could have anything on a flight, I'd have crashes. Oh, yeah, that's I'd a build one. a soundproof room, which is all fun for little kids to be in, so I don't have to stress if my baby starts screaming yeah. and I know Janet's on the flight and she's not happy with me. Everyone's <laughs> happy room. with yeah. a like a playroom crash soundproof. There we go. Just yeah. putting it out there. I know it won't happen, but you never know. Um... From flights to uh, holidays, okay, you head down to the pool. It's the first morning of your holiday. You want to relax in a bit of sun. You want to sunbathe, only to find all the sun beds have been reserved with towels from about five o'clock in the morning. One hotel in Tenerife has now taken matters into their own hands by removing the towels laid down uh, by the pool. And if you're not lying on the sun lounger, the towel goes and it becomes free again. Yes. Is this a good idea? Is yes. this the way forward? Yes. If you're going to be sad enough to get up at five in the morning <laughs> to go and put a towel on a sunbed, I want to see you lying on it by five past five, not coming back at half past ten after <laughs> breakfast and it's been there for five hours yeah, yeah. when someone else might get up at seven and want to lie out till yeah. breakfast. You know what I mean? I think it's selfish. I really do. Equally, it really annoys me that these hotels know exactly how many people are in their hotel mm -hmm. and they never have enough sunbeds. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Ever. Mm -hmm. So they it's down to them as well. They take yeah. your money, so then provide the service. Yeah. You know, I've been to massive hotels where there's like 50 sunbeds. Same. But there's a thousand So are you telling hotel. me you never get on a train and you've got a reserve seat, but it's not really very good. So you put your bag down in it and you go and put your bag in another seat and possibly another seat and you wait till the train's leaving the station and you make a choice and no. then you sit down. You Never, wouldn't take ever, up ever. more than two seats, would you? <laughs> 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 well, only sit in one, Katie. <laughs> no. I would never.
never do. I'd, I'd never be too embarrassed in case someone saw me doing it and then like called me out on it. That would be awful. Yeah. Well, I'm only going to end up sitting in one. And I know, then but you've my... held three. I've already walked past the other two you've held and they may, they may have worked for me. Janet, shame on you. Yeah, I You are a towel sun lounger, Hogger. Yes, yeah. No, I've only done sun lounge towels once and I did get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I admit. But I never did it again. <gasps> 2 o'clock? 2 o'clock in, in the morning? I would morning. want to see you lying there from 2 in the morning. <laughs> did you make the most rhymes. of it? Did you use it yeah. all day long? I you, you didn't disappear for hours and leave it no, and everything else? No. What about you, Katie? Um, I would be the person throwing the towels in the pool. I think it's mm. selfish. Um, it really is. Yeah, it is. Oh, I like I to enjoy it. I've the seen towels. someone leave a towel in the morning and not come back till three in yeah. the afternoon, but they want to sunbathe from three, and yeah. then you go, well, you've had your towel there since seven. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But they want the sooner it there when they the come towels back. have clocks in them, the better. So can someone invent a sunbathing towel that has an alarm in it, and after it's been on a lounger for 25 minutes or two hours or however long your time is, a ping noise goes yeah, As long yeah. as you're on the bed, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. We asked you at home what you think. 61% of you said it is not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay to get up early and put the towels no, down. It's, it's awful. It's all if you've got children and you've got bags and then you come down and suddenly everything's taken up and you go, yeah. oh, yeah, it's not what fair. lie? It's mm. just not yeah. fair. Anyway, basic etiquette. That's all we're asking for. Coming up next, uh, we're talking children at weddings. Should they even be allowed? And our series, Life Before Loose Returns. And we'll be hearing how our Katie went from sweet child to wild child and then transformed her life forever. A very emotional life story coming up after this. about you when you see especially when you see some of those shots after what happened to you such a vicious act it really was how you picked yourself up and not just picked yourself up but you actually help other people i i came from a really welcome back that was our katie on the lorraine program 12 years ago she had just won an inspirational woman's award and we're going to be hearing the extraordinary story of the lives she's changed in our trip back in time for life before loose that's in around 10 minutes time before any of that, there was time for today's competition and it'll certainly spice up your summer. Hello from the breathtakingly beautiful island of Crete. Just look at this, I'm having a real pinch me moment. The water is just turquoise, the scenery is beautiful and I'm on board a luxury yacht because we're celebrating the last week of our £90,000 summer sizzler which could all be yours. You could literally charter your own private yacht every single month. And I remember with all of our competitions, there is always, always a guaranteed winner. There is so much adventure to be had and it could have your name on it. Oh, thank you, Paris, you thank you. Soon. Imagine living a life like this with 90,000 pounds in tax-free cash. You could, but you need to pick up the phone and get the entry in. Here's all the details, good luck. For another chance to win, text CASH to 86060. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Go to the website. Entries cost £2. Call 09068 786060. Calls cost £2 plus your network access charge. Or post your name and phone number to DY29 PO Box 7558 Derby DE10 NQ. Entrance must be 18 or over. And lines close on Friday the 19th of August at 3pm. Good luck! A groom has caused a bit of controversy online after admitting he didn't want to waste money on a babysitter on his wedding day, meaning his wife spent most of their special day looking after the children. Some have suggested kids shouldn't even have been at the wedding so the couple could actually relax and enjoy the day together. I'm not sure how you feel about this. Is it a bit of a selfish thing on the dad's behalf here? I would have or... married him. <laughs> it would have gone that far. It would have gone that far. <laughs> or I'd have said, okay, um, if you don't want to pay the money or you don't think it's worth the money to pay for a nanny on our wedding day, that's fine, but you're looking after the kids. Yeah. Like, why is it then it means that she's looking after the kids? But as, as having your own kids at your wedding, I definitely would and I did. You know, Kira was my flower girl. I mean, the boys were old when I got married the second time, but I had her as the flower girl, but I had enough relatives there, like all yeah. her aunties and her cousins, that I never saw Kira all day, really. And at night, she slept with, in her auntie's room and with the other kids. And 
So I never really saw her till the next day, but it was lovely. I'd hate her not to have been a part of our day. Yeah. But equally, people that bring kids to weddings, oh, it's when they bring tiny babes in arms who scream all through the ceremony and they don't leave. That's a, and I think, please age, take think. the child out. Yeah, see, my daughter, we had one child before we got married and she was two. And I wanted to be really present for my wedding day. I wanted mm. to enjoy it. I wanted to spend time and have a laugh with the guests. So we let my daughter come, but we hired a babysitter you know so she and she participated herself she danced till she was tired she went to bed mm. um but yeah i wouldn't want it to be in charge of her the whole day no. because i would have been submersed with, in, in looking after what her, would you have it? done if she had a tantrum just as you were doing your uh, you said she was two and two's an age even i know where yeah, kids yeah. have terrible terrible twos terrible yeah. twos what would you have done if your daughter had had a strop right in the middle of you doing your vows? I would have asked the babysitter to take her outside the church into the yeah. foyer um, because a lot of people have travelled far for that day. Mm. It's taken a and year's it's your day. Yeah, and, and the guests as well that have come <coughs> to share it with you. Yeah. Um, and I think that's fine to do that. You know? I've we been to so many weddings where, you know, so much planning has gone into the wedding. You're an incredible church in the countryside. Everybody's got really dressed up. And one person has got a scream brat and everybody is <laughs> just thinking muscle that child or take that <laughs> muscle child out, out that's a bit like this panel though isn't it there's only there's always one screaming brat on the panel <laughs> thank you i didn't mention names so you just gave you me just owned that, that then Look, you just owned it the person on the panel who hasn't got a child i just i just think that tiny children at weddings uh, the ceremony itself is a nightmare. And well, then some people want to be there and don't have yeah. childcare. No, it's a well, shame for them. Yeah. To that's, that's true too. It's a bit also, though, if it's stressful for the parents so who's stressful. looking after this. It's like we were talking earlier about flights. I, I hate nothing more than thinking I'm ruining someone else's experience mm. because my child is crying. Yeah, it's stressful I, for it's you. It's so stressful mm, for yeah. me then, so I then, you can't quite relax and enjoy it the way that you want to. So mm. you're, you are a really good example of a thoughtful mother. But I live near some people who've got two small children under five who think it's perfectly acceptable for their children to go in the back garden at 7.15 in the morning on a trampoline and jump up and down screaming. It and is. I just... What's OK about that? I mean, that's not garden. early for children. It's not early. Early. It's probably it's half five. I was going to say, and also it's their garden and their trampoline. Yeah, yeah but property. my garden is my sacred space and it's next door. So why I'm quiet? Why don't you garden. live on a child-free street? Well, I don't even want to live next door to a trampoline because I have to look out my window and look at this eyesore, <laughs> this complete eyesore. I think that why don't they just put trampolines in special parks for kids to go well, to? Well, you know where you can find a child-free street? Retirement yeah. home. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the number. This show is supposed to be honouring you, Katie, <laughs> but I'm rapidly learning that Colleen Nolan has poisoned your mind. <laughs> I had my two uh, stepdaughters at ours, and they were young at the time. And yeah. actually, it's some of our best photographs are with them because yeah. we did our first dance. I wouldn't say quite dance, but mm. we got up and did that. Yeah. And they sort of jumped in with us. Yeah, and we've that. got a gorgeous picture of that. And I'd have hated not to have had that. Yeah. Um, but like you say, with loads of family with us and everything else. So it wasn't, they were up dancing until about yeah. midnight, I think. Maybe so. get them to have the pictures and then leave. Mm. Yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get the memory and then, yeah, exactly. Uh, coming up next, uh, we're going back in time with our Katie Piper. How did party girl Katie become the role model she is today? We're going to be reliving the highs and lows of Katie's life in our life before loose. That's all coming up next. I'm here in Hollywood, home to the rich and famous, the weird and the wonderful, a place where anything goes. I'm going to be meeting four of my British mates who have bucked the trend and gone on to make it in Tinseltown. Welcome to La La Land with me, Denise Welsh, only on Loose Women. What you gonna do, Katie? You're a sweet, sweet girl. Welcome back to Loose Women. Yes, that's right. The rest of today's show is all about you, Katie. Hey. <laughs> We're going to take an in-depth look at all your good times, tough times, and all in between. Because, Katie Piper, this is your life before Loose. Please welcome Katie Piper.
Literally two seconds later, my clothes were evaporating and I knew it was, you know, corrosive substance. It's been a long journey yeah. and a very different outcome and I don't know if I would be able to be as strong as, as I have been now. It's an amazing feeling today to be recognised and it feels like a real privilege and an honour. You ever thought I was? Oh, oh, so lovely. Amazing, Katie. And I mean, you have had this extraordinary life for someone so young, really. And if we can take you back, it's 1983. That's right, yeah. October 12th, to be precise. Yeah. And here you arrive, hospital in Hampshire to mum Diane and David. Um, what are your memories of childhood and home life and your parents and your, your siblings? Um, I had a great childhood. So I grew up in a you know small village, quite rural life uh, before technology. Um, I did all my homework on a typewriter or with a fountain pen. Um, I was always outdoors on bikes, roller skates. I was actually a tomboy. Um, I had a dreadful haircut. I had like a bowl haircut. <laughs> yeah, um, I think we all like it. All went through that. But my yeah. dad was yeah. the local barber in the village. Mm. Oh, so, oh, so there's blow. no excuse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you either had your hair cut by my dad or my mum was the local school teacher, so you had detention from my mum. So, yeah. <laughs> so I was popular in the playground. Um, but yeah, well, I was the middle child, older brother, younger sister. And it, it was just, I suppose, in a way, like childhood should be. It was innocent. I never had any real pain or trauma at all growing up. And my mum and dad were really invested in all three of us. And my mum actually gave up her career to, to raise us all. And they really installed in us quite early on that anything you want in life you've got to go out there make it happen for yourself you've got to work hard um, mm. they weren't about big ambition but they were just about independence and making your way in life and you know. and what about then when you became a teenager I was a quite a disappointing teenager. <laughs> Did you go through the wild stage? I think because I grew up in such a small town, I really seeked, like, I wanted city life. I wanted, you know, I was a bit like Belle in Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> thinking there must be more to this provincial town. Um, and I rebelled, you know, I was the smoker, the drinker. I used to jump out the window to go out at night. I pierced my own nose, my own ears, just carried on the, the home haircuts myself. I used to dye my hair with food colouring because I couldn't access hair dye. And yeah, you name it, I, I did it. Now, what about yeah. jobs? What did you start out? Well, Where did you so start working? I, I didn't go to uni, so I left school and I went to a tech college and I did a hair and beauty course because I thought, you know, dad's, mm -hmm. dad's a hairdresser, I'll, I'll do that. I wasn't really academic and I d it wasn't because I wasn't bright, it was just because I wasn't interested. You yeah. know? I was mm -hmm. more interested in going out of my friends, uh, boyfriends, that kind of stuff. So I got a job in uh, Tesco. That was our only supermarket <laughs> in the whole of the town at the time. And uh, I worked there evenings and weekends around college because uh, I you know, had to fund my train fare, my college kit, that kind of stuff. Did you enjoy uh, it? I loved it, yeah. Started off as a checkout chick. Uh, <gasps> then I got promoted to backstage, not backstage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> backstage. backstage. <laughs> but you were always dreaming at that point, Kirby. Back, uh, back, uh, uh, back of the shop, doing the tannoy when all the potatoes. Oh, my God. Wow. I yeah. am so jealous. Oh, that is the one. Fun. Every time I go in a supermarket, yeah. I want to be on the tannoy. That's where I found my posh <laughs> boys. Um, and then I got another promotion. Oh, do me an so. announcement. <laughs> go on, Kirby. This is um, in aisle one, Maris Piper potatoes are now reduced. I repeat, Maris Piper potatoes <laughs> are now reduced. <laughs> I love, love it. it. Uh, and I, I would buy been, those potatoes. Yeah, yeah. I've heard Move that. onto the tobacco counter, selling the scratch cards. Mm. And yeah, I mean, for me, I actually loved it because you could get um, double pay on bank holidays. I did all my um, college holidays. I'd work there as much as I could. And I, and I sort of understood the value of money and, and working hard and seeing what you could get out of that. Mm. So again, a happy chapter actually wasn't yeah. it it was and it kept you at home at that point too so I'm guessing your parents were very yeah. happy with you having the sort of the job, yeah. the normal job. My such. parents were pleased that I was in college, but working as well. And mm -hmm. even now, when I go back to my hometown, I still see the people I used to work with in the supermarket and speak to them and stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's nice to have had that foundation. Mm. Yeah. But were you ambitious? Um, yes, I think I was ambitious. I think a side of me always wanted to look after myself and be independent. I think I was a thrill seeker as well. So ambition mixed with excitement as well, uh, which was probably quite a dangerous mm. combination, yeah. But that was probably what made you sort of push yourself 
for bigger and better things. And you did always feel that London was calling a little bit for you. Yeah, I worked in a sort of uh, spa, like a private health club as a beautician, and it was mainly doing um, massage and uh, manicures, pedicures. I used to massage Dr. Hillary. He was one of my clients. <laughs> really? Yeah, I wish him to say there. Oh, that's He'll awkward me now. Saying that. yeah. <laughs> I, awkward. I was his go-to for a full body. Um, <laughs> so, but I did that for a couple of years, but it was very uh, limited for me in that you could only earn, you know, your eight hours of pay and that was it there was no progression I set up my own business doing clients mobile in their own home um, and then I went back to college in the evenings to study to teach the theory side like the anatomy and physiology of beauty therapy but I was only sort of 19 20 so I was too young to be a teacher in a tech mm. college because the students were going to be older than me um, so then I, I moved to London uh, to seek out a different life I, I, you know I looked for beauty jobs and at that time I moved into a shared house and all my housemates, we'd rent the bedroom in, in a five-bedroom house, all my housemates were aspiring actresses, models, dancers, in theatre, promo girls, and that was, that was the road I took. But that yeah. wasn't something you'd really thought about at that point at all then? Was it just kind of being with those people and feeling the excitement that they yeah. were living? Uh, it sort of thought, actually, that's a bit of me. I think at that age, I think I was probably 20, 21, I think it felt exciting. Yeah. Who mm. knew where it may, may or may not take me? Um, it, it was more money than what I was doing at that time. So what did you start doing? Well, I've done everything. I've given out samples of shower gel and shopping centres. <laughs> um, I've worked on shopping uh, telly, selling solar panel lights. I've worked on quiz shows till four o'clock in the morning, unscrambling the anagrams. Um, I've been in furniture catalogues and adverts. <laughs> and yeah, that was me there, with the solar panel lights. Yeah, I mean, you, <laughs> you name it, I, I did it. Yeah, and it was just talking absolute rubbish for hours. But I think at that young age, I felt like, well, I'm pursuing my dreams. It's exciting. And there was a lot of partying around it as well. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of rejection as well around various auditions and mm -hmm. things. But and when you say partying, we're talking a lot of partying. You, you enjoyed being in the yeah. big smoke. So me and my housemates, we lived sort of more or less sort of centralish London. And um, Monday to Thursdays, we'd go out clubbing in the West End and we'd leave Friday to Sunday to the tourists. <laughs> and that, that was the days we'd go to the laundrette, go to the Chinese takeaway, uh, go online. And, and, and apply for 100 jobs at once to get rejected by 99 of them. Um, so how many nights a week did you go out? Monday to oh, Thursday, yes. yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> Every oh, week? Yeah. Wow. Socialising, sometimes clubbing, sometimes drinking, eating, whatever. I was like, I've always been a real people person and yeah. I've always wanted to grab life and, and live it and loved glamorous things. So, yeah, I mean, it's different back then. We didn't document everything. Yeah, we didn't have right. social, social media. media. Did yeah. you want didn't... to be a television presenter then? Yeah. Was that your ultimate goal? I did. I always wanted to, you know, be in that world and... Uh, talking on telly, connecting with people, a glamorous life. Um, mm -hmm. I used to watch Lee Swimming as well. No. Yeah, no. I've watched Lee Swimming as a child. Like, was Colleen like, on it back then? I think she was, yeah. I think you were. <laughs> there you go. Colleen Nolan was my inspiration. That's, that's, just, oh, that's, just, that's lovely of you, but it's also quite embarrassing of how long I have been here when she was a child. <laughs> it was a different life back then, though. You know, we would all swap clothes, me and my friends, because we didn't have lots of money and it wasn't fast fashion. And yeah. it, it was just actually quite an in a way an innocent way of mm. living and, and fun you know mm. what, what were your parents views at that point um I think they wanted me to get a job that um had a wage slip proper had, job yeah had a pension yeah. I yeah. think they still think that now yeah. Yeah. Um, I definitely don't think they wanted me to sort of live hand to mouth or be self-employed mm. but equally I must praise my mum and dad they've always let me find my own identity do my own thing and they've always been there to support me if things do go wrong so mm. they never shunned my choices you know but they didn't necessarily Really approve, but yeah. they were they were consistent in yeah. their support. I, I mean, that's going to resonate with I think probably yeah. most students. Yeah. What you mm. just said there, now twenty one. Yeah. I part. Yeah. I mean, I, I did it as well. But, but you were you were living your best life basically. Mm. Yeah, at point, I weren't think so. You? Yeah, yeah. Um, loads more to talk to you about, obviously, Katie. Um, we obviously have to touch on the day that did change your life, and um, but more importantly, how you then find the strength to absolutely pick yourself up and to, to carry on living. And that was the most important thing. And it took a bit of time to get there, but you did get there. Um, this is a little clip from your documentary, which I think is a groundbreaking documentary, I think it's fair to say, and certainly started to begin the change for you as well. I want to like blossom into a confident, able woman. 
the scars, the mask, everything encased me in this little shell. And I want to break free and be my own person, you know. Katie's story continues after this. Hello again, welcome back. More Life Before Loose with Katie straight after today's competition. Hello from the beautiful island of Crete where we are living it up at the Austerian Sweets and Spa Five Star Luxury. Now just imagine all the luxury that you could have with our £90,000 cash prize. It is totally tax free, yours to spend on whatever you like. Big question when you're sat there looking beautiful on holiday what would you do with ninety thousand pounds i would buy a winnebago and travel all the festivals that sounds like my sort of style that's exactly what i would do but what would you do with ninety thousand pounds in tax-free cash you will never know unless you pick up the phone today so here's all the details for another chance to win Text CASH to 86060. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Go to the website. Entries cost £2. Call 09068 786060. Calls cost £2 plus your network access charge. Or post your name and phone number to DY29 PO Box 7 558 Derby DE10 NQ. Entrance must be 18 or over. And lines close on Friday the 19th of August at 3pm. Good luck! Now lines are closing this Friday, so make sure you get your entry in and you could be somewhere like this. Absolutely beautiful. Back now to Katie's life story. And we've heard so far, Katie, you had a, a very happy childhood, a few rebellious years in the teenage era, um, moved to London, a bit of modeling, a bit of TV presenting. You had aspirations certainly at that point and enjoying, enjoying your life. Mm. But at the age of 24, there was this day that did change everything. And indeed, the days and the weeks after that, more importantly. Um, got your memories of that time just must be so clouded with various emotions, I guess, even at this point, Katie, haven't come so far. Yeah, it's funny because when I look back on it and reflect, it does feel like two separate lives. And, you know, I, I'm 38, but I sort of feel sometimes in my sort of 70s or 80s because mm -hmm. what's happened to me condensed in such a short period doesn't happen to some people in a whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. So in some ways you can take that as a positive, you know, life experiences enrich us, they build our character and we can go on to use that in the future when, when we need to. But in other ways, it, it was a lot. It took its toll on me mentally and physically and obviously some of some of the physical changes are still sort of ongoing in, in my medical journey mm -hmm. um but I suppose you know talking about my childhood before I think everyone when they're young has that thing at school where you draw what you want to be when you grow up mm -hmm. or what you think life looks like and it might be a house with a white fence and a dog and a cat or whatever but nobody draws that and, and nobody prepares for that so it was like my life was turned upside down in a matter of seconds mm -hmm. So, and I think lots of different things happen to people and what's happened to me is obviously more visual, but I think we all experience trauma in varying degrees. And I do think trauma is a fact of life, but it needn't be a life sentence. Mm -hmm. So the next period of your life started with life-changing surgery, groundbreaking surgery. Yeah. And then at the age of 24, you're back at home yeah. with your mum. Yeah, and it wasn't like going back home when you've run out of cash or you no. split up with your partner. It was like regressing mm. and learning to swallow, uh, difficulties of breathing, like all your independence and dignity as well um, sort of taken away. I mean, I was really lucky that they were my carers, but... I wasn't your average 20 year old. I was, I moved out at like 17. I was so mm -hmm. independent. So it was hard, but at the same time, fortunate enough to have that st stable place to go back to. Mm. And adjusting to life, I suppose, from, from your parents' perspective as well, you know, you're, you're their, their, their baby and then suddenly they've taken on this carer role and, and dealing with something that was just so, so awful for them to have to see you go through. Yeah, I think also it was quite complex because I suppose when people think of Burns, you think of sort of military heroes mm. or 
burns in the kitchen or with fireworks. And I don't think any of us understood the extent mm -hmm. of how it affects so many functions and so many other internal medical problems that we all had to sort of educate ourselves on. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it being so complicated that it wasn't an accident what happened to me. Mm. So there was a long legal trial, yeah. um, several different charges that the whole family it affected, my, my siblings, my parents. Mm. You know. How did people react to what had happened and then your surgery and your face? Well, it's interesting because how people reacted was my motivation to do the documentary that we saw that clip from. Because initially, um, I looked very different to how I sit here today. You know, I wore a plastic face mask for two years. I had a shaved head, very sort of purple red appearance. So people reacted by asking me to leave shops, uh, people shouting at me in the street. But, you know, I wasn't famous. I wasn't known. People didn't understand why I wore a mask. So... The documentary was a mixture of things. I wanted to explain why I looked this way. I wanted to educate people. I wanted to relieve myself of that isolation mm. um, and explain I'm not contagious. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not got something that means I need to be rejected from society. And I think anyone that's been through a legal trial, particularly like mine, where there was a, a, a rape charge, that whole trial is built, built on telling you that you're lying and, mm -hmm. and what happened to you didn't happen. So I think taking back that empowerment and having that voice became very important to me. Is that kind of what spurred you on then? To, uh, yeah. Because you must have had very, very low moments wondering whether you could ever get over this and never go out again and never face the world again. What was the pivotal moment where you thought, I am, I'm going to and I have to? Um, I believe that in life there are some things that are out of our control but we're always the captain of our own ship. And, you know, and your life is ultimately in your hands. And I just think I knew I'd fight it so hard to live in ICU. What was the point if I wasn't going to go out there and grab it with both hands? Mm. Yes, I'm not going to be everyone's cup of tea anymore. Yes, life's going to be slightly different. But did you have but, a face? I mean, what, what was it that, um, that gave you the strength? I didn't have a faith before. and I don't come from a religious family, but I found a faith. And I, I had a, a turning moment in intensive care and I realised that some things happen to certain people because they can deal with it and I identify with that and that you can go on and help others who can't. I had brilliant treatment. I knew there was a better way and I knew as somebody with a facial disfigurement you could still feel sexy, assertive, you know, all those things that we don't label somebody uh, with a visible difference as. And I felt very, very strongly mm. about that. And... I, I just thought, this is my life, and who is anyone to take it away from me? I'm just going to get on with it the best mm. I can. And I didn't know the answers. I just knew I had to make the best of this, whatever that is. And it didn't always turn out well. It was mm. hard sometimes. Which is why the, your, your documentary was so groundbreaking at the time. Katie was back in 2009. There was also a big interview that you did on This Morning, which I think was another sort of audience for you almost to get your story across there. And that definitely resonated with, with a huge number of people. Um, just remind ourselves of that moment sitting with uh, Phil and Holly. I think doing the documentary was really a massive help psychologically because it gave me confidence and pushed me that little bit further than yeah. I might have naturally progressed. If this had happened a couple of years before, the facilities and the medical procedures that were available to you would not have been available. It would have been a very different story. That's right, a very different outcome. And I don't know if I would be able to be as strong as, as I have been now. So yeah. I'm very fortunate to have had that, the treatment that I've had. It's just an incredible moments looking back. It must still, because you've come so far even since then, obviously, Katie, but to have had the, the strength to sit there and do that interview at that point, as you said, mm. Clean, there must have been moments you never thought you could have done that. Yeah. And that, that was a massive step forward, wasn't it? I think it was good for me to put myself out there like that. Like, you know, I wasn't wearing makeup. I think I'd been wearing the mask then, but took it off for the interview because it, it kind of affected my speech. And I think it was good for me to just say, this is me. And it didn't mean that I felt confident, but it sort of preempted that. So when I walked into rooms or went places, I felt like I'd already put out who I was, my authentic self. But then self you felt you were on a mission to help other people as well. That's the part of your story I find uh, the most moving, that not only had you overcome so much, 
but going forward, you saw a way to help other people. Yeah, and I think that was connected to a faith of what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of life? What is my purpose? Like, what a privilege to find your purpose at 24. Some people don't find their purpose in their 50s or 60s. Some people only find their purpose when they're at the end of their life making a bucket list and it's too late. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'd had this great experience with my treatment and, like I said, felt a different way to others and I wanted to give that to other people. Mm -hmm. And I had this weird opportunity where Simon Cowell got in touch with yeah. me after the documentary and he offered me a job as a runner at his production company. And the old Katie would have grabbed that, you know, a yeah. chance to get into telly with one of the most famous people. But I knew that actually it, it's not going to be fulfilling. Like, there'd been mm. so much that had happened. So I talked to him and said, I don't want to do that, but I want to do this. And I said to him, I want to sponsor other people to get this treatment. I want to set up a community. I want to change things to burn survivors. And he got behind me and he still is to this day. And the difference that you've made in, in so many lives at this point, Katie, it is remarkable because it can be such an isolating, awful time for people going through what you've been through. You just feel like I'm the only person and actually you're not. And there is help and you get a, you, you gain a great deal of comfort from, from that as well. Yeah, it became my passion. And I think selfishly, it helped me make sense of everything. And mm. when I wasn't coping, it sort of gave me a reason not to give up. And, mm. you know, I, I, for me, I was able to meet other people, like-minded people. And I became fascinated with the medical side, the research, and it was a welcome distraction. Well, uh, a lot of people hugely grateful for all the work that you've done. And this is one of them. Hi Katie, this is just a message to say thank you on behalf of me and also all the other burn survivors that your charity, the Katie Piper Foundation, has helped. You, in a moment of darkness, were able to turn it into light by creating the Katie Piper Foundation and without the charity, I personally would not be mentally and physically thriving like I am today. Oh, thank you there. That's um, Katrin. She's one of the strongest women I've met. Uh, she was badly burnt in a coach crash mm -hmm. and I mentored her and the charity supported her. And actually we now employ her. She went to uni to train as a physio and she now works at our rehab centre as a, a physiotherapist to our patients. So, yeah, she's actually a really incredible person. Mm -hmm. so, That's so fantastic. Yeah. And Katie, you are, of course, now... An OBE, <laughs> which we love. Mark. And you know, the day that we talked to, to you live that day on the show when you picked your OBE up and your mum and, and your family were there. And I have to say, I, I, it was, I felt so happy for you that day. <laughs> for all of your family, it yeah. just felt like one of those yeah. moments where that's deserved. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what it all comes down to. Katie, you're remarkable. We know you love you. Your story <laughs> is remarkable. And yeah. Kitty Piper, that's one of the best ones it's we've done. Great. I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Katie, for sharing that. That's all we've got time for today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.